Cooper DeGene is a star, and we're going to talk about the latest article about him from Pro Football Focus. A look at Cooper, the preseason All-American, and what's next for the Iowa Certainly five-star player right now. Plus, Iowa baseball gets it done in the Big Ten Tournament, an opening win against Michigan. All coming up today on Locked On Hawkeyes. Our Locked On Hawkeyes, your daily podcast on the Iowa Hawkeyes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in. I'm Trent Condon, and this is the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen every day. Available wherever you get podcasts. You can also find us on YouTube. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. While you're there, it helps us get in front of more Hawkeye fans. Well, today, a special guest, our big get from Pro Football Focus. He is Max Chadwick. Thanks for joining us today, Max. Good to catch up and talk a little Iowa football here in the offseason. How are you doing? Trent, thanks so much for having me on. I don't know if I'm, I'm as quite of a big get as, as you made me out to be, but I really appreciate you having me on. And yeah, I'm super excited to talk about Iowa football with you. Well, pro football focus has been something of, uh, well, not a punchline. It's just something that Iowa fans say, well, we know it's going to be something good if it comes from pro football focus. Right. Certainly on the defensive side of the football the last couple of seasons. So you wrote an article about Cooper DeGene. We're going to talk about that here in just a moment, but just an overview for people maybe new, haven't checked out Pro Football Focus and what you guys do on both the pro side of things and the collegiate side of things. Uh, just an overview of what Pro Football Focus is. Sure. So we try to do the impossible task of grading every single player on every single play in every single game. So, um, you know, our work has been, you know, a lot of people may, may not love the grades. And, and I, I, for one, am not someone who say the grades are everything, you know, and, and nobody from PFF would say the grades are everything. But we try to, you know, grade every single player and every single play to go more than just the simple stats that you see. Like for Cooper DeGene, for example, yes, he's got a ton of interceptions, but really he does a lot of other things that makes him such a great player than just picking the ball off. So we want to go deeper than passing yards, deeper than stuff like that. And, and try to really see who are the best players, both in college football and in the NFL. And that's why we grade every single player. And, and that's, and we've kind of revolutionized offensive line, how people look at that. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's kind of, like I said, an impossible task that we try to do, but our data guys are, are the best in the business. So yeah, that's what we try to do at PFF. You know, what I like to do is see if what I'm seeing from you guys kind of me measures up with what I watch when I'm watching the game, either in the stadium or back home when I'm rewatching the game and, and seeing if it mirrors. And there's times, honestly, I don't exactly know how you come up with those numbers. And really the biggest one is offensive line. Now, I, I do not have any kind of background in grading offensive alignment or anything like that, but that's always the most difficult thing is you see a guy and a lot of times he misses a block or two and you're like, well, he had a terrible game. But when you're doing every single snap, Maybe it doesn't grade out there. The The offensive line one, though, I'm sure, is that the most difficult position to grade game in and game out? Yeah, it probably is, is up there for sure. And uh, quarterback is for sure, too, because you try to look at, you know, what, what the reads are. And sometimes you, it's not completely – you don't know what the reads are sometimes. But for us, what we have at our disposal and why, you know, I don't personally grade any of the players, but why I think our graders are some of the best in the business is – they are trained by people who've played the positions before. So, for example, uh, he doesn't work with us anymore, but Bruce Gradkowski, longtime NFL backup quarterback, he used to be one grading a lot of the throws, and he, you know, trained all of the graders for quarterbacks. And, you know, it's like that for pretty much every position too. So it's not like it's just me, Joe Schmo, or anything like that, looking at a guy and saying, oh, this is what he was supposed to do, and I know that because, I don't know, I, I just watch football a lot. No, our guys are trained by guys who've played the position and say – listen, when you're watching a guy, this is what you should be looking for on this play. This is what you should be looking for on that play. So, like I said, the grades aren't perfect. Nobody at PFF will say they are. But they are a very, very valuable tool when you're looking at a player because, you know, we, we do have tend to have some really good people training us in, in, in our grading. Well, Max, let's get into your latest article at Pro Football Focus, and it's about Cooper DeGene, the preseason All-American. Five interceptions a year ago, and he was – it's such an interesting prospect coming in from the high school level. He's out there in Western o uh, Iowa at Odebelt Arthur Battle Creek, Ida Grove. That's a mouthful of the high school that he played at. Watching him play when he got to the semifinals in the championship at the Unidome, watching him on the hardwood, just 
drop step dunking on guys at six foot one. Something you don't see certainly at the two way level. I don't think at any state. And we knew he was a plus athlete. Most people thought he was targeted to be a safety. That was probably going to be the position that he was going to end up at. But what he did starting two years ago during his freshman campaign, he never played cornerback before. He never played right. the position. And he's thrust into the lineup against Nebraska, goes on, plays the bowl game. And then what we see from him a season ago, the versatility that he plays with, is it sheer athleticism or is there more, do you think, to the story about what makes Cooper DeGene such a versatile football player? Yeah, and you know, the, the whole theme of this article about how I wanted to paint Cooper DeGene was just this extremely versatile jack-of-all-trades type of not only player but athlete I mean you mentioned his his decorated high school career not only you know was an amazing quarterback and defensive back for his high school also was a great wide receiver for his high school as well he also uh, has 55 more career basketball points than Harrison Barnes who's still in the NBA right now is a top 10 pick in the NBA draft so Cooper DeGene superstar basketball player he also won the state championship in both 100 meter dash and the long jump at, at Iowa so, and then also he's a three-year varsity baseball player as well. So the athlete, yeah, is exactly the way to describe him. He's, he excels at pretty much everything he picks up. Um, but, yeah, on the football field too, he plays every single position basically for that Iowa defense. He plays outside corner, slot corner, uh, a little bit of that cash linebacker role, a strong side linebacker, and even sometimes lined up an edge defender on a few plays this past season. So he's a guy that they literally line up all over the field, and I think it is more than just sheer athleticism. I think he's a very savvy football player. You look back at that Rutgers pick six that he had, that wasn't his guy, and he even told me in the interview, he's like, no, I was covering the guy on the underneath throughout man-to-man coverage. I saw the safety had help from uh, underneath for me, so I dropped off, and I saw that our linebacker or our safety – was struggling with the receiver, so I went over the top and picked it off. So not only was it a great athleticism, obviously you got the pick six on it, but not only great athleticism, but he's a very, very savvy football player and why I think he's able to excel in all those roles because any other normal football player would look at all those different positions they're playing and it'd be too much for them. And for him, it's just out there playing football. So he's able to process everything at such an amazing rate and it, it helps for sure that he's a superstar athlete as well. It definitely has that when you look at him and his best position, when you look either at the next level at the NFL or what he has here, I know Iowa has been looking at the transfer portal, maybe looking to find another cornerback either for a depth piece or could that be maybe possibly they believe that the cash position is his best position and if they can find another starter on the outside that they think his versatility and playing in a little bit more, playing that slot corner and playing cash, that ultimately that is his best position. Yeah, I think uh, he might be a little too small to be like, we're talking about the NFL, you know, full time. He might be a little too small, 205 pounds to be playing linebacker full time. But I think his best role is probably as kind of like a strong safety slash slot corner hybrid at the next level. But for Iowa, I mean, you're saying, oh, what's his best position? It's simply get him on the football field. You know, you put him, do what you did last year and let him be a chess piece in Phil Parker's defense, who I consider to be the best defensive coordinator in college football. Let him be a chess piece in that defense. And I think he still will be that this year. I think he'll play outside corner. He'll play in the slot. He'll play cash linebacker. He'll play maybe a little safety too. I, I think he could do it all for Iowa's defense. So it's not until the NFL where I think he'll probably specialize at one position. But for right now, I mean, I don't know why Iowa would, would look to have him rather than anywhere. You know, he, he should be playing everywhere for that Iowa defense. He is an absolute stud and a great kid on top of it, which is makes it pretty easy to root for. So, Having the conversation with him, talking with Cooper, kind of your takeaways, just as him. You talk to a lot of athletes, you talk to a lot of football players. Just your takeaway of Cooper as a person. A super humble guy. You know, I, I, in every one of these interviews, I always try to like go in there and hype him up a little bit so I can get maybe uh, a great quote from them about the NFL or anything like that. But he he simply was like, listen, man, I, I'm just out there. I'm trying to help the team win. And, and that's kind of his mindset. And, and it's genuine, too. You know, sometimes you get those political answers, and sometimes you can tell him that he's being a little political. Uh, but no, he, he is genuinely all about the team. Uh, so yes, yeah, super humble guy. Um, you know, he's excited about the prospect of potentially joining the NFL, but he even said, he's like, listen, man, for me to even be at that point, I got to excel on Saturdays in the fall. So he's super focused on just taking it day by day, heading into the season. And yeah, all he cares about is helping the Iowa Hawkeyes. And he says everything else in the NFL awards, whatever that'll come after, but all I'm focused on is helping the team win. We know Cooper is a stud. We're going to talk a little bit more about the rest of this Iowa football team. Max, I am not normally the most optimistic person out there as it pertains to the teams that I root for. Got a lot of DNA that has been uh, certainly hit hard with some 
some sad times throughout the years, but I am optimistic about this Iowa football team. We're going to get into that as we continue our conversation. Max Chadwick joining us from Pro Football Focus as we roll through. This is the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs. Right now, new customers can get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. Great promotions every single day. We got the Eastern Conference continuing here, a possible elimination game for the Celtics. First to 10, first to 20, player props, you name it, they have it all on a safe and secure app, and you can get paid instantly. No better place to bet all the playoff action than America's number one sportsbook. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. We continue on the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen every day. We're joined by Max Chadwick from Pro Football Focus, a look at this Iowa football team coming up this year. So a lot of optimism, as I mentioned, from me. The defense, though, they lose some pieces. You lose Jack Campbell, you're placing with Nick Jackson, who was a three-time All-ACC player at the middle linebacker spot. Thought you saw some good things out of Jay Higgins the first time he was thrust into the role a year ago. Defensive line is as deep as I can ever remember any position group at the University of Iowa, even losing a first-rounder in Lucas Van Ness. And then Cooper DeGene in that defensive backfield going to be very good. Depth may be a concern at linebacker and defensive back, but overall, the defense will be the defense. Are there any guys that you've looked at, any Hawkeye players that you're excited about on the defensive side of the ball, maybe a little bit more under the radar than, say, a Cooper DeGene? Ooh, that's a very good question. I think obviously Cooper DeGene is a superstar and you lose, not only do you lose Lucas Van Ness and Jack Campbell, but also Riley Moss is a guy in that uh, defensive backfield too that I was a huge fan of last year. Uh, Quinn Schultz, a guy that I, I actually, you know, I've watched a little bit of his tape. I like what I've seen from him. I think you mentioned before the defensive line is going to be absolutely fantastic this year, but another guy in that secondary, I think Quinn Schultz is, is a guy that I, at least I'm keeping my eye on, but for sure the, the superstar of that defense right now, is Cooper DeGene, especially when you lose three guys, two of them uh, picked in the first round, another one picked in the third round from that Iowa defense. Cooper DeGene is, is for sure like that, you know, superstar of that Iowa defense right now. Bringing back another year of Joe Evans, he decided to use the COVID year. He has a six year of eligibility, really good off the edge, made a great play against Ohio State as Iowa, well, kept it close for a little while until the offense absolutely tanked there. Excited about him get another season. Uh, Deontay Craig's another guy that's already getting some buzz, maybe even an early entry next year on that defensive line spot. Didn't play a ton of snaps, but the last two years when he's been out there, he's been incredibly productive. Long arms, longer arms, certainly than the frame looks like there. What do you guys see with Deontay Craig? Yeah, he's a guy. Yeah, you mentioned that. I think the potential is, is, is really through the roof for that guy. And uh, I think as a pass rusher, he showed a lot of really encouraging signs. I want to see him grow a little bit more as a run defender. But definitely as a pass rusher, that's a guy that, you know, has made some impact plays uh, for you guys at Edge Defender. And, yeah, he's a guy that I, I am pretty excited about next year. You mentioned the tools. I mean, yeah, he could be a guy that NFL teams have uh, on their radar. Special teams, Torrey Taylor comes back for another season, average over 45 yards per punt, really good on that. We know what he can do, pinning teams deep inside the 10, inside the 5, and at times even inside the 2. And that's helped out uh, many times with this Iowa team. Drew Stevens had a great freshman year. But the one remaining question with this Iowa football team, Max, and I know you know it, is the offense. So a lot of new faces coming in, including a bunch of grad transfers at the wide receiver position and most importantly at the quarterback position. Let's go to Cade McNamara. Didn't play much last season, ended up having surgery at the uh, middle portion of the year as he sat out the rest of the season before making his way to Iowa City. Go back two years ago, though. What kind of quarterback is Iowa getting in Cade McNamara? I think he's a guy that, you know, is a, is a really good game manager. And I think he's, that's exactly the kind of role he played in, in Michigan's uh, offense a couple years ago. And he, look, they made it to the college football playoff that year. So this is a guy who's, who's had the experience in big time football games. And really he lost out the job this past season, but really it was a, to a JJ McCarthy. who has got, you know, sky high potential and, and who I think is a top 10 quarterback in the country. So uh, really, I don't think it's, it's unfair to, to look at Cade, to look at Cade and say, oh, he's a backup quarterback, you know, is he really going to be that good? I think he's going to do a, a pretty good job in that Iowa offense. The issue is I don't think he's a quarterback that's really going to elevate uh, the supporting cast too much. I think he's kind of going to play to to how good the supporting cast is. I like the offensive line. Connor Colby, I think, is a superstar at offensive guard. 
But other than that, you know, they, they need to get some some pieces in there. You mentioned all the transfers coming in. Eric All, who uh, who Kate is very familiar with at Michigan, I think is a really good tight end. Um, he'll probably continue that Iowa tradition of having really good tight ends after obviously Sam Laporta uh, goes to the NFL. But yeah, I would say uh, Kate McNamara is a game manager. I think he's going to be a, a pretty good one for Iowa. Just got to, you know, build up around him a little more. Caleb Johnson at the running back spot a year ago, true freshman, kind of th- thrust onto the scene in the game that ended up uh, past midnight against Nevada with all the lightning delays uh, back earlier last season. He finished the season nearly an 80 grade at pro football focus. He was not the starter. LaShawn Williams is back, but it feels like this is going to be Caleb Johnson's game. He's got some incredible numbers. I remember you guys had uh, one of those timing things and seeing the speed that he was playing at one season as he was running in for a touchdown. Caleb Johnson, it seems like something that your guys' metrics certainly like over at Pro Football Focus. Yeah, I like, uh, Caleb Johnson is really good. And he, he's got good size position at six feet tall, around 210 pounds or so. And um, he had 800 rushing yards last year, and over 500 of them came after contact. So he's a guy who really plays well through contact. He broke 41 tackles last year as well. Uh, so, yeah, I'm I'm super – and like I said, he's only a true freshman last year. So I'm super excited to see what uh, – what Caleb Johnson has in store in his sophomore campaign. And he could be one of those guys that takes some of the pressure off of Kate McNamara's shoulders. So uh, this is going to be a little bit more difficult one. Caleb Brown comes in from Ohio state. Now he played four years, still maintained his redshirt status last year at Ohio state. People look at the numbers only had one catch last year and say, well, I mean, Iowa, what are you really getting here? As a former top 100 pick though, limited reps for Ohio state, but walking into that wide receiver room, Hey, if you play four games in that wide receiver room, I think that's a heck of an accomplishment as a true freshman. Anything at all on Caleb Brown, anything that Iowa fans should be looking for helping out in a big time place. They need help at wide receiver. Yeah. I think, you know, and you mentioned it big time need that they have at wide receiver. And I think Caleb Brown is, you know, got all the potential in the world. Like you mentioned before, he was nearly a top 100 recruit in his class coming out in 2022, still a very, very young player. Um, and, you know, you look at that stat line, oh, one catch for five yards, and you're like, oh, that's not too great. But you really think about that. I mean, first of all, it's true freshman season. Second of all, you're playing in the best receiving core in America. You know, you have Marvin Harrison Jr., you have Emeka Ibuka, Kate Stover at tight end, Julian Fleming at wide receiver. They have other wide receivers there, too, that are very, very good. So I don't think that's really indicative of how much talent that Caleb Brown has. And this is a big-time get for Iowa. And I think he could end up being the top receiver on this team potentially uh, by the end of his sophomore season. So, yeah, I think he's got a lot of potential. He obviously very, very highly rated recruit. And, you know, looking at his stat line and saying, oh, you only had one catch for five yards. Is he really that good? It's like he was also playing in the, the best receiving court in America. And it was only his true freshman season. So give the kids some time. He's got a lot of talent. And I think Iowa desperately needs talent in that receiving room. They got it in Caleb Brown. All right, one more for you, a pro football focus grades. I'm really going to have you dig deep. So Iowa helped fortify their offensive line. They bring in Rusty Feth from Miami of Ohio. I do not have uh, the Miami of Ohio numbers in front of me. What kind of guy? Do you have any numbers from him? I'm not sure how deep into the Mac you guys go, but Rusty Feth started at center, also played a lot of guard during his career, three-year starter, all Mac player. Iowa needed help certainly inside and the versatility to play both center and guard. I think that's a good thing as well any numbers for us for rusty feth yeah rusty feth uh i don't know if he'll end up being a, a tyler linderbaum type of player that you know we've, we've grown accustomed to seeing but yeah you mentioned he's a two-year been a starter over the past two years uh for miami and he was a pretty good pass blocker this past year he had a 70.6 pass blocking grade the year before he actually wasn't very good at pass protection but he was really good as a run blocker 76.3 grade and his run blocking grade this past year was a 54.7 so not too great so it's, it's kind of interesting seeing how he's progressed you know, his first year as a starter at Miami, uh, he was a great run blocker, not a great pass protector. This past year, pretty good pass protector, not a great run blocker. So if they can put it all together next year, and obviously the big thing, you know, when you're saying for transfers is how they're going to translate. Um, when you're going from a conference, like you said, in the MAC to the Big Ten, that's a big jump, especially for offensive linemen where it's so much based on who you're playing against. Uh, that's why I don't, I don't know if he's going to make a big jump uh, going from like that, even though it's his third year starting. But I do think Rusty Feth, you know, if he can be more consistent in both areas, he could definitely be a guy that can start for Iowa and be a pretty good starter for them. Awesome. Hey, appreciate your time as always. This has been a lot of fun catching up, talking some Iowa football here in the offseason. The article is up right now at Pro Football Focus. PFF.com is where you can find it on the college link. 
and find everything there. For people interested in Pro Football Focus, we talked a lot about those numbers. They are available, how people could get involved and what it takes to become a member over there to get all the great articles with Pro Football Focus. Yeah, so you can find them all on pff.com. You can subscribe to pff.com, get all the premium stats that we were just listing off. Uh, so if you want to go to your friends and say, oh, I know how good Rusty Feth is, like like uh, I was able to pull up just immediately because I'll be honest with you, like that was a guy who I, I've heard the name before, but I really didn't know the stats. I looked him up real quickly as you were asking the question, and I was able to tell you exactly the kind of player Rusty Feth has been over his couple years in Miami of Ohio. So if you want those stats like I just did right there, go check them out at pff.com, get all the premium stats there. And, and yeah, and check out all the articles that we do there at PFF too. Awesome. Hey, Max, appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us today on Locked on Hawkeyes. Thanks so much, Ryan. Really appreciate you. Max Chadwick, pro football focus. Find him online at Chad underscore Maxwick. A little vice versa of the name there. We continue on here on the Lockdown Hawkeyes podcast. The Iowa baseball team gets it done. Game one in Omaha. We'll talk about it and setting up a punch to the next round of the Big Ten tournament. That's as we continue here on Lockdown Hawkeyes. Trey kind of back with you one final time on the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen every day. Big appreciation there to Max for hopping aboard with us today. A lot of good information and certainly setting the scene of what should be a lot of pomp and circumstance coming up this year in the offseason. The buzz is going to continue to build. I don't think we're going to be alone. Questions are made on offense, but a lot of good stuff there from Max and I really enjoy the article talking about Cooper DeGene. We wrap things up here. Iowa baseball with a great win today against Michigan. There were some hairy moments early in the game, tied up at one apiece. Michigan strikes first. Iowa comes back. So Marcus Morgan, starting pitcher today, pitching on shorter rests than normal. Remember, he got the opening start. They moved a couple of weeks back. Brody Breck moved back to the number three role. He elevated from the number two up to the number three role up to the number one. So they flip-flopped them. And Marcus has been really good. He was also named one of the top pitchers in the Big Ten this year. We saw a lot of great things and a lot of honors for Iowa baseball, and we'll get into that in just a moment. But to see what we saw out of this team, Morgan struggling, not throwing strikes, throw 85 pitches, only 45 of them, four strikes, walks the first two guys of the fifth inning, and what happens? The team bears down. They go to the bullpen, great work. Bases loaded, another walk after that, loads up the bases with nobody out. Three consecutive strikeouts and just throwing some absolute Frisbees up there. It was a lot of fun to see. Jack Whitlock came in out of the bullpen. He was outstanding there and got out of the jam. Iowa then started to pile it on. The bats came alive, opened things up. Sam Peterson out of Ballard Huxley. He had a big uh, big home run, and the team rolls on to the victory, and they 10-run Michigan in the opening round of the Big Ten tournament. Now they await the winner of the Indiana-Illinois game that's going on this afternoon. They'll have a day of rest, though. That's another great thing about the structure of this tournament and the way Iowa playing early is going to have a little bit extra rest here. Opportunity to set things. We'll see who the starter is going to be. You'd anticipate it'll be Ty Langenberg and Brody Breck then will get the third start of the tournament here. But getting off to a good start, as we told you in yesterday's podcast, you or every dayers know about that as we were setting the scene just how important it is. The last seven Big Ten tournament champions won their opening game, and 11 of the last 13 have won their first two game, two games of the Big Ten tournament. Indiana, we saw them earlier this season. Iowa fell two out of three games, won the first game 7-1, to and then lost two one-run games. That was in Bloomington, though. Indiana has not been the same team away from home this year. One of the top teams in the country in terms of home record has not been the case away from home. Still a really good team. They're the number two seed. Iowa the number three. We'll see if Indiana or Illinois advances, and they will get them coming up on Thursday. Great news there. Iowa continues to build their NCAA tournament resume. Iowa came into the tournament here today with an RPI sitting at 32. That will increase with the neutral victory against Michigan. That will be a definitely a, a good one for them. In fact, let's take a peek here and see if it has updated. It has not yet uh, here today. But 32nd coming into play today in great position to be an NCAA tournament team. They win their 40th game of the year. Now three of them were against non-Division I teams, so they do not count in your NCAA tournament resume as they look at it. But I will put together a really good schedule. Nice win here. 13 runs on 14 hits. The six-run fifth inning as they open things up. 
and then tacked on two more in the eighth inning to win it 13 to three over the Wolverines. And now we await either Indiana or Illinois. And then the NCAA tournament, can Iowa, how high can they get? Number two seed, maybe in a region. That'd be great to see. Maybe put themselves in a position where they can make a little bit of a run with the one, two, three punch that they have in their rotation. Boy, don't want to bet against this, this group. They're playing some really, really good baseball. That does it for today. Thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen every day. We're available wherever you get podcasts. You can also find us again on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button. Five-star reviews helps us get in front of more Hawkeye fans. Thanks for Max as well for joining us here. We'll be back with you tomorrow. We'll preview the second game of the Big Ten Tournament and a whole lot more. Every day as we got you covered. Thanks for being with us on the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Go Hawks.